Good morning. <laughs> My name is Kasha Chen. Uh, I'm a fourth year medical student with Med School Coach, and I'm here to talk to you guys more so just about my journey through um, pre medicine and then medicine, and hopefully take some questions at the end. Um, any burning questions you have about the application process or um, any other questions that you may have. Uh, okay, so. So this is me. Um, I went to, I did my undergrad in MCDB, Molecular Cell Developmental Biology. I'm currently a fourth year medical student at California University of Science and Medicine. I am currently doing my research year in artificial intelligence um, for abdominal radiological imaging. So that's kind of what I'm up to. And in my spare time, I have a really big passion for teaching. So that's why I've decided to partner or join Med School Coach to not only help my two T's individually one-on-one, -on -one, but also um, teach some classes as well as do events like these where I get to meet people who are interested in medicine and that really excites me because healthcare is a great industry no matter what they tell you on the internet. <laughs> um, it's inspiring, it's rewarding, and it's, it's really something that if someone had asked me, you know, maybe if I could turn back time five years, if I would still do this career. And it's, I would say, yeah, I, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. So I hope as I go through my story, um, you guys will also find some inspiration and figure and be able to draw from that uh, what you're planning on going into in the future. Okay, so let me just get to know you guys a little bit. <laughs> How many of you guys are high school seniors? Okay, I see five. <laughs> okay, what about high school juniors? Okay, six-ish, six, seven, nice. Okay, you guys are starting early. All right, sophomores, sophomores. Oh, three, okay, any freshmen? Oh, wow, hello, wow, super early. <laughs> I, that's, that's so great to see. And out of everyone here, how many of you guys are considering a career in healthcare? Not specifically medicine, just healthcare. Okay, perfect. This is the right spot for you guys because no matter where you go into in healthcare, I think all the things I talk about today will be relevant. Okay, let's begin. So this is kind of an overview of what pre-medicine and medicine looks like. As you can see, it's give or take about 20 years of your life. And that sounds like a lot, but really every single bubble, one of those bubbles up there is going to represent a different part of yourself. So when you're in college, you're gonna be learning a completely different set of skills. When you go into your gap year in med school, you're gonna learn a completely different set of skills. And I can't speak to what happens after uh, you start your residency, but I'm sure it's going to be a whole different set of challenges and highs and lows. So really before you start your journey in terms of just purely going into medical school, really think about um, how long it's going to be and um, the experiences that you're gonna get from each part of these, uh, each, each step of your journey. So let, let's, start, let's start with me. I, uh, I immigrated here from a young age. I actually grew up in Shanghai. I didn't speak English whatsoever. Um, I came here around the age of five and I moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico. All right, I didn't know anyone there. I moved there with my family. Um, and after that, I also moved around a, like maybe nine different places. So I never really put down roots anywhere. There were really no big mentors in my life that I could look to or email or you know, hit up on Instagram or something <laughs> and ask for advice. So really my biggest role model during this period of time when I first moved to America was my mom. You know, she worked really, really hard. She would go to work every single day, come home, cook dinner, and then also uh, make sure I did my homework and, you know, ask me about my day, whatever. And that was just every single day. And that level of dedication is something that I took away with me, you know, throughout my journey, which is you must have an extremely good work ethic to get anywhere in life. 
and you can look, I'm sure I see some parents here in the audience, so you can definitely look to your parents for that inspiration. Just see how hard they work, you know? It doesn't matter what their job is or what they do or, you know, but do they show up for you every single day? And if they do, that takes a certain type of work ethic and discipline. And that's something that you'll learn throughout your pre-medical journey as well as your medical journey. Um, okay, so in high school, okay, for high school, I ended up having three jobs. How many of you guys have any part-time jobs right now in high school? Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, how many of you guys do extracurriculars in general besides school? Okay, everyone. <laughs> okay, amazing. Yeah, so those things take time, right? They take time out of your studies. Um, they take time out of you studying for your AP test. It, it takes time, but let me tell you, it's not wasted time. Having employment, having extracurriculars teach you things beyond what school will teach you. And that includes communication skills, presenting skills, um, ways to manage your finances. Um, there, there's many different things, but it teaches you a lot about responsibility. So I want you to, I encourage you to continue working and continue your extracurriculars, whatever that may be. I personally worked at Round Table Pizza. I was the girl that stood behind the counter and you know sliced the pizza into 16ths. Um, I also worked as a hostess at Aberdeen Cafe out in Fremont, so you guys probably never have heard of it. Um, I also worked part-time at a hair salon where I'd be washing people's hairs. And, you know, those experiences I did because, number one, I wanted to be, you know, supportive of my family. I knew it was, lim like, financially limited, but also um, I wanted to be able to pay for all those extracurriculars, such as um, you know, fees for volleyball, like you have to pay for the uniforms and joining and things like that. So, <laughs> um, but those experiences taught me also work ethic. So I, I want to uh, encourage you guys to continue um, those extracurriculars and employment that takes up your time. Okay, now let's talk about something more fun, TV shows. I was interested in a lot of different shows, but I think now looking back, the things that really uh, made medicine seem right at that time. I watched a lot of, you know, Grey's Anatomy, Suits, um, House, Supernatural, sci-fi alien stuff, mutants. I was just really interested in the science of it all. And although in high school, you know, I have no idea what's going on on the cellular level, except maybe that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. But besides that, I had no idea. But these shows really opened up my world to things beyond, um, you know, working and going home and studying and you know, going to volleyball, whatever. So TV shows were a pretty big influence on me as well. Um, and I have to say, high school me did not know I wanted to be in medicine, <laughs> okay? High school me did not know. And so I chose the thing that I was good at, which was math. <laughs> um, sometimes I think it's easy to pick something that you're really good at because it's comfortable. You're in a comfortable place, and so you choose to do something that makes you feel comfortable. And medicine is not a journey about comfort. So that first step where I chose math as my, um, as my undergraduate major was not perhaps the right step for me at that time. If I had someone to maybe shake me and say, hey, you should figure out what you're interested in, not what you're good at. So I, I know there's some freshmen through seniors here in the audience. So I encourage you to look into what your interests are based off of your extracurriculars, your TV shows, whatever, and don't just choose something that makes you feel comfortable because that might not be the thing that will serve you best and serve your purpose in the future. So I chose my major, I went to college, I took all those uh, math courses and I'm like, oh my gosh, like what have I gotten myself into? Like do I actually wanna be an actuary, an accountant? A consultant like is that really what I want to do with my life no at no point in time I was like you know what am I doing this for and so I ended up taking this one like general biology class and I loved it you know like studying didn't feel like a chore I mean yes it was difficult and yes I really wanted to get a good score but it didn't feel hard it felt exciting and that's when I knew maybe I should do something in the science field I can talk about some of the other classes that I took that really inspired me and pushed me towards this medical journey. Spe specifically, I took this vertebrate physiology class, and I don't know if there's anatomy offered either here in the high school or at the community college or um, 
I don't, I don't know where, other, where else you can take classes, but if you ever have the chance to take a good anatomy physiology course, I would encourage you to do it. There I was able to dissect a shark, a cat, um, I think those were the only two. But not only was I interested in the anatomy, I loved applying the physics of it all to the form versus function, meaning why does the muscle look that way and why does it attach on certain areas of the bone? It does, how does it improve the movement of the animal or the vertebrate, pers or the vertebrate animal? And so this was a class that was very similar to medical school, and I encourage you, if you're interested in you know, taking classes in medical school, to explore a class in anatomy. Do some dissection. Do some form and function exploration, and um, that will help you uh, decide, I guess, if you are interested in medicine. Another person that opened my mind and was, I. Like I said, my first role model was my mom. My second role model, I'll name his name because he's a public figure, but Dr. William Lowry. He runs this human stem cell lab out of UCLA, and he taught this human physiology course um, that absolutely blew my mind. I did not know that you can scrape some skin cells off your arm, introduce some proteins to it, and it will revert into a baby-like state where then you can induce it to become any cell in your body. Okay, his lab does I believe he does that, but for particularly for, for stem cells that are in the hair follicles. So he helps with hair transplant services. Um, but this class taught me so much and opened my mind to the field of medicine beyond what I had seen on TV shows. Okay, this is not just uh, Grey's Anatomy, someone's like running down the corridor shouting, ah, he's coding, he's coding. No, this was pure science. It was at the fundamental level, where are, we at in, where are we at in science? And being able to use those new technologies to make changes in people's lives in the future. And that was really, really inspirational. And I thought, oh, you know what? Maybe I'll go get my PhD. <laughs> uh, but no, OK, so then I didn't do that. And I ended up changing my major to um, the major that this, was, this class was under. And I continued taking these classes. But it wasn't until I met my third role model, um, Dr. Soleimani at uh, Beverly Hills Cardiology. He, I applied for this job through a face, our, our like UCLA uh, Facebook free and I think it's like job posting. It's, anyways, this is a Facebook page where all the students can basically post listings to other students. So using my network, I found this, um, this inter summer internship at this cardiology clinic. And for the first time, I was put into a place where I felt pushed. I was out of my comfort zone. There was nothing about it that was, uh, that was easy to me or I felt I was good at. I was a, this role required me to be a medical scribe, um, help with prescriptions, look at lab results, as well as call patients. And mind you, I was the slowest typer, okay? I, I think I typed like 30 words per minute. I, don't, <laughs> I was the slowest typer. I had no medical terminology, no background. All of the drug medications sounded the same to me. And I was required to put in all this information into the system correctly so that the patient can get the most optimized care. Dr. Soleimani knew I wasn't good at this, but he didn't discourage me. He didn't, in, he didn't encourage me, but he also didn't discourage me. He didn't say, hey, Kasha, like, you really can't do this job. I need to fire you and find someone else that can do this job better. He just spent every day with me at the same level, didn't, didn't dumb anything down to make, to make it easier for me. He just kept at the same level. And when I messed up, he said, you can fix it later after work. So there I was in the first month of my internship, and I would be rewriting these notes that I you know, had so many typos and misspellings, and I had to re-Google these names of the medicines and all that. Um, and he, and I, so I would spend two hours fixing these notes every day after work when no one was in the office. But you know what? After a month and a half, I didn't have to do that anymore. It caught on. And that was because the right mentors will push you. The right mentors will set expectations beyond your capabilities, and they will push you um, to the point, to, to your best point at that point in time. And the right mentors will also inspire you. Dr. Soleimani, 
He talked to every patient with kindness. He always did what he thought was right for the patient. Specifically, I have just one story, which was um, we had this guy come into the office. He was in his mid-30s, someone that you would never imagine having to go to a cardiologist. Well, he had come in and he was all pale. He was a little sweaty. Um, he was breathing really harsh. He was walking kind of slow. He just looked overall like not well. And he, 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 told, he told the doctor, he was like, hey, I don't feel good. I have some chest pain. I think it might be anxiety. I, I, and I don't know, like, I, I think I'm okay. I just need um, like for you to get me some labs and I'll just go home. Well, Dr. Solomon did not let him go home. He said, let me just put you on this treadmill real quick and, and take another EKG and see how your heart is actually doing. I'm gonna go that extra step for you. So he gets on the EKG and within, I think, five to 10 minutes, he, he, he comes, I hear a thump in the back room where we had the treadmill and he, he collapses to the ground. We grab the aspirin from the medicine cabinet and, we, and, and, and give him a really quick uh, aspirin tablet. And he, he gets up, you know, he's fine. And Dr. Sloman was like, you, you cannot leave this office today. Like I have to schedule you for this angiogram that's gonna take a picture of your heart from the inside and we have to see what's going on. If there's something wrong there, we need to fix it. So he takes him to the cath lab, I think three days later, and I, I don't go with him. <laughs> uh, I see him later after his procedure, uh, maybe two weeks after, and I see him and he comes in and he just had such good circulation. He was no longer out of breath. He's walking perfectly fine. Looks now like a normal person in their 30s. And I was like, oh my God, what happened? And so it turns out they had found this huge blockage in the, one of the main arteries of his heart, okay? In, in a mid thirties, um, someone in their mid thirties. And um, the doctor had put in this balloon that cleared that area, effectively giving this guy another 10 to 20, potentially 20 years of life with his family, with his friends, with his aspirations and passions. And I just thought to myself in that moment, there's no other career out there um, that I know of at that time, <laughs> where you could dedicate two to three hours of your time doing your craft, and in return, someone else, someone else gets 20 years of their life back, so 20 years that they can enjoy with the people they love. And from that point in time, I was like, you know what, this is what I want to do. I want to be just like my mentor. So that's when I decided to dedicate myself to the career. I, that summer, I sat down, I did the U World. I don't know if you guys do U World in high school, maybe for AP classes, I'm not sure. I haven't, uh, I haven't looked into that, but I would do those questions. I worked in that office part-time for $12 an hour uh, while I finished up everything and took the, took the MCAT. Uh, after I took the MCAT, actually, I had to quit this job, though, because living in L.A. is expensive, and, you know, you can't really live on $12 an hour. So for those of you who have parents who are financially supporting you, love that for you. You're going to get really far in life just with that. Um, but I had to quit that job, and I had to take a job with investor relations um, in biotech. I, I think I looked on Indeed.com for maybe six months, <laughs> trying to look for a position that would you know, pay for someone with a background like me. Um, and it was a good thing too, because the interview process is very, very costly. I think now it's not as bad because everything is virtual. So a, a lot of the time you might not have to go. Although if you could, I would encourage you because then you can really check out the campus culture. Um, I, okay, so my interview process took a lot of money. The application process through AMCAS also costs a lot of money. So make sure that, you know, where, whichever step you're in to um, uh, have some reserve funds for these processes, because it's not free. So, yeah, and I, I went through my interview process and, okay. And I finally got my acceptance um, to CUSM. And that was a dream come true. I walked by my old School of Medicine building on my old campus, and it felt so unreal. I, you know, I had been on that other side walking to work or whatever so many times, and 
it, it was unreal that I was finally going to be, after you know several years of struggling, to be at the place that I wanted to be. But in medical school, I met the smartest, hardest working, kindest, and compassionate peers from all types of backgrounds. These were no longer people from my school or from my hometown. Um, I felt really intimidated. I was, I was middle of the pack or lower, okay? And I, I was used to being at least middle or higher, and I was probably in the low, middle, low. And while, while that may feel intimidating and bad, it really pushed me to the next level, just like that cardiology office did. Your peers are so important, and they're the ones that are going to teach you the values from their life experiences that you can adapt into your own and push you forward. Your family is also really important. They teach you values from, you know, when you're age zero to 18. As well as your teachers. They, they will also teach you and inspire you and show you every day how much, how much they care about the profession um, and challenge you with the coursework that they set for you. So let's go back a little bit. I'm going to rewind. My five tips for pre-medical success, because I feel like this is probably most relevant to everyone here in the audience today. Uh, my medical school journey, while important, um, is a little bit too far in the future. So let me just go through my five tips for pre-medical success. The first thing that you should do, no matter if you're a freshman or a senior, is to make a long-term plan. I encourage you to write down um, a five-year plan, starting with next year. And every year, I want you to write to yourself what you're going to do in that year. Is it taking the MCAT? Is it getting the supplies for your MCAT so you can start prepping? Is it finding a clinical research job? I want you to have a five-year plan, okay? I want you to clearly write it out on your piece of paper. Number two, I want you to set short-term, easily achievable goals. What does that mean? Well, when you write a five-year plan and you say, after five years, I'm going to get into medical school, and, and that's that, well, that's a huge mountain. And a lot of high school students, pre-med students look at that, and they feel like they can never get there. And that fear of failure will set you back. So I encourage you to set short-term, easily achievable goals, whether that means, hey, maybe on Friday, I will talk to my parents very seriously about where I want to be in the future whether that is, let me apply to five jobs today. It doesn't matter if they reject me or whatever, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna apply to five jobs. And when you do enough of these short-term, easily achievable goals, you build confidence. And that sets you up for doing harder things in the future that you, know, you, you feel like you can't do. And with enough time, you know, with enough time of these short-term, easily achievable goals that you achieve, you build a reputation with yourself, and eventually you will be able to tackle all the hard things that come at you in life. So set those short-term goals. Number three, I encourage you to look up Pomodoro method and focus. The human mind isn't really trained to focus beyond like 20 minutes, I believe, is what the science says. And so if you just sit there for 12 hours a day studying for your AP test, how much of that is actually spent watching Netflix or texting your friends or Snapchatting or, I don't know, looking up things on Twitter? Okay, I, I imagine it's gonna be about 50%. So what I want you to do is for your each day that you, each study session is to do that 25 minutes, time it on your phone, do 25 minutes, then take a five minute break, and then do another 25 minutes, take a five minute break, do another 25 minutes, and then hard stop, okay? And then reset whenever you wanna start studying again. But that will really help you um, focus and eliminate that time that you're just mindlessly watching Netflix, okay? I want you to have your full attention on Netflix after you're done with the Pomodoro method. <laughs> you shouldn't be sitting there and, um, you know, looking down at your paper and then looking up. All right, number four, resilience is key. There's gonna be a lot of people and a lot of situations that will make you feel like a failure. And how you respond to that failure is going to determine where you will go in life, all right? There's the, what I call, what, what I tell my students is you have this failure muscle, all right? It's, it's, I'm gonna equate it to a gym analogy, but 
he had this failure muscle. And when you're, a tr when you're in high school, not a lot of people have told you you won't make it. Not a lot, your parents, I'm sure, are so encouraging, tell you that you're the smartest, brightest, most hardworking person out there. But the world will not do that. You know, you'll go out there and that muscle will not be there because you haven't really practiced. But there will be situations that will put that to the test. And each time you look into the face of failure and you say, I don't think so, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep trying. That's when you build that muscle. And when that muscle gets big, no one, no situation will ever stop you. So that's where resilience is. And I encourage you every time that someone or something tells you no, that you keep going because it's a lifelong skill. And number five, choose your peers carefully. We become like the people we're around the most. So if your friends say, oh, like, it's okay if I get, if I, you know, don't pass this class, I can just, like, do something else with my life. I want you to distance yourself from that person if that is not who you want to be. So you really need to choose people with shared values to where you want to go and let those people uplift you and inspire you. All right, let's go back to medical school. <laughs> medical school, um, there's, there's definitely a lot of highlights, a lot of challenges. I already talked about how my peers were so inspirational and pushed me to the next level. There's also going to be your board prep, step one and step two preparation. Those are going to require a lot of time um, as well as financial resources. Um, and then going into your third year, that's when the fun comes in. That's when you're gonna meet more role models in your life. You're going to see residents that are so kind to everyone on the team so smart and so precise and accurate that it is going to inspire you to want to continue your journey. There are also going to be attending physicians that show you kindness and inspire you. I had um, a recent, my recent attending, uh, which I won't name, <laughs> um, she basically let me make my first incision on a patient that where I had never been offered that opportunity. Um, and my chief resident during that rotation also got, made sure that I went to the right procedures, made sure I can shine on rounds, taught me during procedures how to hold things correctly, how to suture, um, and let me take out a human organ for the first time. And so from those experiences, now I move forward knowing that this career is going to build the things that I want to in myself, which is to be, to be strong, to be kind to others and my peers, and also to be compassionate towards the patients. This is what I aim to be, and it's a lifelong journey, okay? And every day, your needs will be different. But if you have the passion and the discipline, you'll be able to meet those needs and get to where you want. So the traditional route is not the only route, okay? My story is just one out of 10,000. There's so many people that go through many, many different things to go to get to where they want to go. Um, option A, you can go to college um, and then in your junior year take your MCAT and then apply to medical school and go directly from, from college. You can take several gap years. You can do a post-baccalaureate. You can do your master's. You can work as an EMT. You can do some other side gigs. I've known some, or you can join the army. There are so many different paths to getting here. But I know you can do it because you're here today on a Saturday morning. <laughs> and I know that me in freshman through senior, I would have never showed up to an event like this. But you're already here, so you've already taken that first big step, which is to seek out the resources and the mentorship that will get to where you want to be. And that really concludes my presentation, but I hope I, you know, inspired, um, educated, or encouraged um, all of you who have attended today to at least consider this career and really think about what it takes to get to this position here. All right, that's it. Any, any questions? Yeah, so uh, my question, uh, just in general, like how many times did you spend pulling all night? In which point, oh, I don't think this is working. At which point in my life? Uh, just during medical school. Just medical school? Yeah, I also did like, uh, like, your, your med Okay, 
let me just put it this way. When you're not doing the Pomodoro method and you're just sitting there studying, it can take you all night. It can take you all night. But once you start learning the techniques for focus, once you give yourself breaks, once you dedicate your mind and feel the discipline, you won't need those all-nighters anymore. So I did a lot of all-nighters probably in my pre-med undergraduate portion because you know I really just didn't know like what I was supposed to do. But in medical school, I actually very rarely pulled all-nighters. What ends up happening is you probably work about, you probably dedicate about 12 hours a day, six days a week to the coursework and you're probably going to be set. So it's going to eat into your weekend, but you're not going to do a lot of all-nighters. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, so would you say, like, so for an um, undergraduate person, <laughs> what are, like, the best kinds of jobs I sh you should look into for, for medical school? Yeah. I mean, it depends on the resources of your school, like where you go. Um, some schools have... Um, a lot of you know in-house opportunities like they'll have research labs um, they'll have summer internships they'll have clinical volunteering within their school and so you all you have to do is apply for those and you can um, email the labs and I believe at least for my school you had like a big list that you could look on to apply for jobs and it I think it was like $15 an hour or something but you apply internally Okay, um, so that would be like a really good job because then you don't have to leave campus and commute and then come back um, to, for your classes or whatever. Um, me personally, I, I, I did like retail sales because um, I, I needed more money than $15 an hour. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> um, but I, I think, so the lab, um, yes, so the lab, clinical volunteering are things that you could apply through your school. Okay, yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Yes, I see a hand, hello. Hi, okay, so do you think your end goal medically is going to be what you wanna be, or do you think there's still an opportunity for you to maybe like change your, change what you wanna be like for your lives? Um, go ahead, hold on to the microphone. I have a question for you. What do you, what do you mean by change? Like not be a doctor or? Like, no, uh -huh. I don't mean like, I mean yeah. like specifically, you know, like uh -huh. you said that you wanted to be a doctor in a certain field or yeah. do you think that, you know, there's still opportunities for you to change what specific aspect of the field you want to be in? Oh, I, a specialty. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I didn't go over that too much, but basically at the end of your at the end, well, the beginning of your fourth year, you probably should know in medical school what you want, what specialty you want to go into. And if you don't know, this is the opportunity for you to do away rotations at other institutions or within your own institution that are outside of your core rotations. Like what we think about when we think about specialties, there's so many things outside of that. So you would rotate for about three to four weeks with each of these special other specialties that you're interested in. And if you're interested at that point in time, then you can apply for that on your match. Although, although, I would definitely explore a lot in your one through three year because, um, you know, medicine or applying for match now has become almost a, uh, you have to have a lot of research. You have to have a lot of pertaining extracurriculars. So if you know ahead of time, then you would be able to do specialty specific research in your medical school time. Um, and that would really help your application then. Um, yeah, so, so there's opportunities for change. I actually do know people who have done their first year of internship and then later on they switch to a different specialty after their first year of residency. It's, it's not traditional and I don't, I don't think there are many examples of that, but um, it's definitely not undoable, okay? Any other questions? Yes. What like a uh, habit that should we start like learning earlier before getting into like a medical field? What habit? Like something that would help us uh, in the medical field like earlier before like- Before what? Saying, like uh, if we're the, at the medical field, like if uh, we're struggling with something, what's something like we can start learning earlier before getting into it? Hmm. At, uh, oh, sorry, what, what, gr what grade are you in? Or <laughs> sorry, you're a freshman? Yeah. Freshman, okay, freshman, okay. I think freshman 
what you should really do is talk to your parents, okay? Is talk to your parents. Um, you need to build up this like support network that is there because there's going to be things that you do in the future that you have no idea how to do or you're gonna fail. Like you have a test the day, the day after and you're like not doing well in your practice test. There are gonna be those moments. But right now what you need to do is really build up that support network, whether it's from your friends, from your parents, maintaining that open communication with the people around you so that in those times of difficulty, they'll be able to call you up and be like, hey, you can do this. It's okay if you don't do well on this test, just go and take it. That's gonna be so valuable for you in the future. Okay? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh yes, hello. Uh, what do you recommend like, hmm. in high school? What classes should we take to prepare for like our undergrad? Sure. Um, I think in high school, what you should be doing is trying to get into the best undergrad that you can. So it's, I wouldn't think so far as to medical school yet. What I would think about is I would look at people who have been admitted to the university that you want to go to, look at those people um, like what they've taken. So have they taken, you know, AP classes and bio and chem? You know, did they, did they, you know, do some really cool extracurriculars? And I would follow that and get into the good, um, a good institution that you want to go to. And then from there, you'll meet more people that will help you um, on your journey to pre-med. So I would say right now, oh, I would say right now what you should do, um, is figure out how you can get into the best university that you can or that you want to go to. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, no problem. Any other questions? No? Oh, okay, hi. 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 I was just wondering um, what you thought the best extracurriculars were for, um, that would be helpful to get into a good like, undergrad program. Oh, to get into a good undergrad program. Oh, wow. Well. I think to get into a good undergrad, you have to really be passionate about what you do. So it can't be like, oh, I was the president of this club for one year and then I just like did whatever after that. You know, like it's just like a, a thing on your CV, right? It's not something that you truly care about. So I would, I would say that you should do projects that you're willing to do for all three or four years that you have left and commit yourself to those, make something of it, make it better. Um, and I think that will really shine in your application is having that passion and having that dedication to see it through. Okay, any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, we have our army presentation, we're so excited. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much.